Hello and good morning dear students and welcome to Baidu's exam prep IS. In today's Hindu news analysis, let us take a look at the various articles we have. In the detailed analysis portion, we have two articles. The first article is about how the higher educational institutes, they can assist the world in achieving the sustainable development goals. Now, these goals, as you all know, they were adopted back in the year 2015. However, according to latest reports, the world is not on the track to achieving these goals by the target year, that is 2030. So, we'll take a look as to how the higher educational institutes, specifically in India, can help India achieve these SDGs. The second article, it is an article that is written by our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi on the contributions of Professor M. S. Swaminathan, the father of Indian Green Revolution. In this article, he talks about the various works that Dr. M. S. Swaminathan has done and what all we can learn from his life. In the prelims bite section, the first article is about the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, Nobel Peace Prize of this year, it has gone to an Iranian activist who is working for democracy, gender equality and other aspects in Iran. She is currently jailed since the year 2021. The second article is about the extinction due to climate change. How the amphibians... They are facing extinction due to climate change, the risk of extinction. The third article is that Russia might pull back from the nuclear test ban treaty. Because as of now, United States has never ratified this treaty. Now, what is this treaty? Who all are signatories? Whether India has signed this or not, we'll take a look in this part. The last article is about how RBI has flagged that there is a risk of inflation. However, in its recent monetary policy committee meeting, it has decided not to increase or decrease the repo rate. So in this section, we will try to understand what is the monetary policy committee. So let us come to our first article. The first article. Aligning Higher Education with United Nations SDGs. Now, recently a report was released by UNDESA. What it is, we'll take a look in the upcoming slide. Now, according to this report, which is known as the SDGs Report 2023, the world is not, not on the path to achieve these sustainable development goals by the year 2030. In the recent past, there have been many incidents that have led to this thing, that have delayed our achievement of the sustainable development goals. What all things are there that the report has flagged? First, definitely the COVID pandemic. Then, the Russian-Ukraine war. Then, climate crisis which has been causing a lot of disasters, natural disasters all across the world. Be it floods, be it glacial lake overflow, be it forest fires or things like that. Even delay of rains, it is causing what? It is affecting the agricultural economies as well. The fourth is generally weak economy. due to all these things. So all this has been affecting our achievement of sustainable development goals. Now this problem compared to the developed world, it is more prominent in the least developed countries because they are more badly affected because of these issues. There is an inflation in food prices, in fuel prices. They do not have access to funding to fulfill their socio-economic projects and that is why these countries, they are most badly affected. India also has suffered the setback because of all these reasons, because of all these factors. India has also experienced this setback. 
Now, a little bit about the sustainable development goals. Now, these goals, these are the all 17 goals. So, in the upcoming slides, when I talk about SDG 3, SDG 10, SDG 17 or so on, you will know what I'm talking about exactly. So, these goals, they were adopted in the year 2015. Each goal has different targets. And based on fulfillment of these targets, it will be determined whether any country, any region has achieved that goal or not. So goals are 17, targets are 169. The number of targets under each goal, they differ. Okay. So these are the 17 of them. The first is for elimination of poverty. Second, elimination of hunger good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation. Then we have affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnership for the goals. So these are our 17 sustainable development goals. Now it is advisable to all of you that as UPSC civil service aspirants, you should know all these goals by heart because mentioning these goals in your mains answer will help you in enriching your answers. Now this report of 2023 it has been released by UNDESA, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Now, this graph shows that in which goal, how many of the percent of targets they have been either on track or there is fair progress. However, we need to accelerate that progress. We need to pick up our speed so that we reach the ending point in time. And third is stagnation or regression. For example, in goal one, which is about elimination of poverty, none of the targets of this goal, they are on track to be met by the year 2030. Okay. So this is the scenario, the global scenario right now. G goal one, goal four, goal eight, 13, and 16. For all these goals, none of the targets, they are on track to meet their intended goals. Okay. Now, India's commitment to SDG 4. See, India, it released its new education policy in 2020, which is very much committed to providing quality education at all levels be it primary, secondary or tertiary. So while we are focusing on the school education, NEP also focus, focuses upon higher education. That is education beyond your class 12th, your college educational education or any vocational kind of education. But why do we need a specific focus on the higher education apart from the school education? See, there are multiple reasons for that. And with proof, we can say that if a person has the higher education degrees, they will be comparatively better off. What is the proof? There is an OECD report. According to this report, people with higher education degree they are more employable and they earn on an average 54% more compared to people who have only done their schooling, who have never gone to the colleges or done their PGs or UGs and so on. Okay, so 54% higher wages. So this is your proof. So that means that if we want to eliminate directly, if we want to eliminate poverty, we need to ensure one, people have higher education and according jobs, 
they are available in the economy. Secondly, it also accelerates social mobility, be it gender wise, be it caste wise in India, be it race wise in the other parts of the world, empowers people through creativity and critical thinking and grants them employment skills. So what is this higher education helping us with? Which all goals is it helping us with? It is helping us with SDG 1, poverty. With SDG 2, if a person is not poor, they will be able to buy food for themselves. So hunger. They will be able to access the health care of the country. Health care. Then gender equality, SDG 5. SDG 8, which is about decent work and economic growth. If these people, they are able to bag decent jobs, at the same time, the companies will also be getting good workers. If the companies are getting good workers, the industry is getting good workers, there will be economic growth in the country. It will also help in reducing inequalities. Now, SDG 5 is talking about gender inequality and equality. SDG 10 is talking about other kind of inequalities in the global economy, like income inequality, like inequality on the basis of other kinds of identities. Okay, So, higher education will not just help in SDG 4 directly. Indirectly, it will start helping in all these SDGs as well. Now, NEP 2020 demands that Indian higher educational institutes, they should map their activities, their day-to-day -day functions, their administrations, operations in such a way that they should align with the sustainable development goals. So, our national education policy is committed to sustainable development goals as well. Now, in general, how can universities help in the achievement of the sustainable development goals? See, first, they are providing higher education. So, as we saw in the previous slide, SDG 4 and the rest of the SDGs that we saw here, they will definitely be fulfilled due to the role of the universities. Apart from that, what can they do? There can be a strengthening of research and teaching nexus in the university education so that the education that you get, you are able to apply that education in order to find out some real world solutions to the problems. There are so many problems. As we saw the Sustainable Development Goal Report of 2023, climate change was one of the reasons why we are not able to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So that is a real world problem. If the institutes, they promote research apart from just imparting knowledge, then that will help in resolving these issues as well. The people, they will be curious, the students, they will be curious to find solutions to the problems that might in future start affecting their lives. The universities, they can also promote multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary education. Okay. For example, if you go for, say, MSc in, sorry, BSc in, say, physics. If the university is also providing you with a option to opt some optional, optional subjects from say a discipline that is teaching history, then that will mean you have multidisciplinary, you have the opportunity to achieve multidisciplinary education. Okay. So these are not just arts and science, there can be multidisciplinary education in engineering and science, engineering and arts and humanities and other fields as well. Okay, so what will it help in? It will further help in strengthening your research aptitude. A science scholar, 
they might study the humanity subjects and realize that people they are facing all these problems historically or currently that will help them further picture out how the solutions they can be prepared for those historical problems or the current problems in the society okay so the research aptitude it helps with your research aptitude helps in making your research more people friendly and it can help in providing solutions to global problems like affordable and clean energy which is a part of what sdg 7 sustainable cities and communities which is a part of sdg 11 climate change and global warming which is sdg 13 apart from that how the various sdgs they are impacting the economy the society how the solutions of these problems they can be received all that can be resolved if universities they allow for this as well as this industry collaborations can also help in achieving the sdgs 9 and 12 what are these SDG 9 industry innovation and infrastructure responsible consumption and production so if the universities they create a network with the industries the industry experts can come and teach the people the practical skills the students they can learn the practical skills and the university research wings they can help the industries with the innovation with sustainable production and consumption so it is a win win situation for both the universities and their research wings as well as for the industries also value based education becomes very important a moral education a genius without any morals can be one of the most destructive forces in the world so that is why morals and ethics they become so very important in the field of education so that also needs to be imparted to the people so that they understand the the where is the importance of these sustainable development goals ranging from goal 1 till goal 17 also the universities should not just impart the sdg values to the students but they should also imply these sdgs within their day to day administration as the new education policy has stated okay so when the students see that the university is also adopting those practices how the university is adopting that then these students they will go out of those universities and wherever they go they will ensure that those models of sustainability they are replicated all across the world okay also universities they should not work in silos they should work along with the community any kind of higher education it needs to be integrated with socio economic development of the community that is residing all around the university campuses or the community that has asked for any kind of help from the university so the universities they should ensure that the students they get a chance to go out into the field to understand the problems of the community and to come up with some solutions for that so there can be certain courses specifically designed for community engagements in the universities as well so these are all the means through which the universities the higher education institutes they can help they can assist the country in achieving its sustainable development goals so in this article what all we studied first we talked about the sdg report of 2023 and how because of problems like 
COVID-19 pandemic, Russia-Ukraine war, climate crisis and a decline, general decline in the global economy, the world is not on the path to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now we also talked about the various SDGs that we have from 1 to 70, the 169 targets that are used to determine whether or not we have achieved an SDG. Then we talked about how India is committed to SDG 4 through its new education policy. Later, how the universities and the higher educational institutes can help in achieving the sustainable development goals. Now we move to the second article of the day, which is important from your GS4 perspective. Now in GS4, you all know that there can come questions like, what, who is your role model? Write a few points about your role model. What do you learn from them? Or there can be one personality and it can be stated, what do you learn from the life of this person? So MS Swaminathan, he was a very important Indian person, okay? One of the most brilliant minds of his time and one person who has improved the lives of so many Indians, provided food on the plates of all the Indians. He has helped in reducing the food insecurity in the country. You all know that earlier we were highly dependent upon other countries for our food needs in 1950s, early 1960s, right? And that was causing a problem with regards to our sovereignty. Because if we would have clearly stated our opinions against a particular country, against a particular region, then that region, they might have stopped the food exports to India, affecting our food security. So that is why I came in the 1960s with the efforts of Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, the Green Revolution of India, which made India not just only food sufficient, but also a food exporter. Right now, 40% of rice trade of the world, the 40% share of rice trade of the world is with India. And back in July, when India restricted exports of certain varieties of rice from our country, that led to one of the biggest crises with regards to prices of rice. So that proves that India has now a very high status when it comes to agricultural exports, specifically the grains, okay? And all thanks to Dr. M. S. Swami Nathan. So in, as a tribute to him, our Prime Minister, Sri Naren Modi ji, he has written this articles talking about the contributions of Dr. M. S. Swami Nathan and how they will continue to inspire and guide us. Now, here is a small timeline about Dr. M. S. Swami Nathan. Now, he, he came into this field. He was inspired to join the field of agricultural research because of the Bengal famine of 1943. Now this famine, he saw how people, they were struggling to eat two square meals, how they were not having any food on their plates. And he was so empathetic to his cause that he decided that he will join the field of agricultural research and he will become an agricultural scientist to improve Indian agriculture so that None of the Indians, they have to face the same problems as they had to face during the Bengal famine. In between 1947 to 49, he joined the Indian Agricultural Research Institution to work on plant genetics and breeding in order to develop such varieties of plants that are very much relevant for Indian conditions. In 1954, he collaborated with Dr. Norman Borlaug. Now, Dr. Norman Borlaug, he is known as the father of 
ग्रीन रेवल्यूशन डॉक्टर एम एस स्वामीनाथन एज फादर ऑफ इंडियन ग्रीन रेवल्यूशन नाउ डॉक्टर स्वामीनाथन ही वर्क विद डॉक्टर नॉर्मन बोरलाग वाइल ही वॉज वर्किंग डॉक्टर नॉर्मन बोलराग वाइल ही वॉज वर्किंग विद द हाई ईल्डिंग वेराइटीज मैक्सिकन वेराइटीज ऑफ वीट बिटवीन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी फाइव टू सेवेंटी नाउ बिफोर दैट इवन बिफोर दैट डॉक्टर एम एस स्वामीनाथन गॉट मल्टीपल ऑफर्स टू ज्वाइन इन यू एस ए एज अ फैकल्टी फॉर एग्रीकल्चरल रिसर्च हाउ एवर ही वॉन्टेड टू वर्क फॉर इंडिया एंड दैट इज वाई ही डिक्लाइंड ऑल दीज ऑफर्स एंड स्टार्टेड डेवलपिंग वेराइटीज ऑफ सीड्स एंड फर्टिलाइजर्स दैट विल बी यूजफुल फॉर इंडियन कंडीशन बिटवीन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी फाइव टू सेवेंटी ही मॉडिफाइड दीज ग्रेन्स to suit the indian soils these high yielding varieties to suit the indian soils and he engaged various farmers of punjab haryana and uttar pradesh the states where already wheat cultivation was going on he engaged the farmers from here to take up certain pilot tests of growing these high yielding varieties of wheat on a small portion of their lands now these farmers they did it and they realized that suddenly there was a huge spike in the total production of wheat and this spike in production of wheat this acceptance by the farmers to grow this high yielding variety of wheat the credit of all this the credit of the green revolution it goes to dr m s swaminathan between 1979 to 82 he was the director general of the icar indian council for agricultural research in 1982 he became the first asian person to hold the post of director general of iri international rice research institution institute which is located in manila in philippines he became the first asian to become the director general and as at that position he decided that he wants to work to promote the participation of women farmers in rice cultivation in the year 1987 Dr M S Swaminathan he received the first world food prize now all the proceedings of this prize they went into another project by Dr Swaminathan in 1988 he set up the M S Swaminathan research foundation using the funds of this prize he developed this institute in chennai and it is still very much in work it is working for the development of agriculture all across the country in 1990s according to this article by our prime minister we are currently doing what we are currently trying to promote the shri an that is the millets the discourse on millets at a national and a global scale has started only very recently but dr swami nathan he has been a pioneer in that aspect as well since 1990s he has encouraged this discourse around the benefits and uses of millets benefits not just only health wise but also environmental and social benefits he had been talking about them since 1990s the final discourse it has come into being at a global scale only very recently in 2002 he was elected as the president of a nobel peace prize winning pugwash conference on science and world affairs which works for bringing security all across the world okay so here as a president he talked about how these conflicts 
all across the world they are affecting the food security of so many people so here too as a president of this particular conference he still was working for providing food to the plates of people all across the world in 2004 he became the chairperson of national commission on farmers and he released various reports suggesting means through which the farmers their lives they can be improved by provide increasing their access to credit by encouraging or making agriculture attractive for the young farmers so he gave many such suggestions as the chairperson of the national commission on farmers some of these suggestions they were adopted some are yet to be adopted and farmers across the country they are forcing the government to rethink the idea of adopting all the suggestions by dr m s swaminathan at during his tenure in 2005 he joined the united nations millennium projects hunger task force as well again contributing to what contributing his ideas towards reducing of global food insecurity in 2007 he was nominated as a member of rajya sabha and he introduced a private members bill in the year in 2012 the name of this bill was women farmers entitlement bill of 2011 now what was happening during this time in the rural india was that the income from agriculture it was not enough to run the entire household so the heads of the family that were usually the male members because of our patriarchal society of majority part of india these male members they migrated out to the urban areas or the semi urban areas to get jobs in order to supplement the income from agriculture so the female members they became the heads of the family and there was an increase in feminization of agriculture in rural india so dr m s swaminathan he saw this pattern he understood this and because of that he introduced this private members bill he was also apart from india he was also very much instrumental in setting up agro research institutes in many parts of the world in some of our neighboring countries as well which are the neighboring countries we have china sri lanka pakistan apart from that countries like vietnam myanmar thailand iran and cambodia so dr m s swaminathan was instrumental in that as well so what all can you learn from the life of dr m s swaminathan first is empathy he was so moved because of the bengal famine seeing his compatriots without any food on their plates he was so moved by that that he decided that he'll become an agricultural scientist and bring about a revolution to reduce food insecurity in the country and then at a global scale scientific rigor he identified the problem he did not sit down after identifying the problem he worked in a very scientific manner to bring about solutions permanent solutions to that problem he brought in collaboration with dr norman borlag and many other researchers he brought about a revolution in india the green revolution in india he introduced the high yielding varieties of seeds that were compatible with the indian soils he also researched for what he researched for varieties of fertilizers that were useful for indian soil again so he believed in bringing about scientific solutions to the problems he had a lot of grit and commitment he learned the thing he learned the problems associated with india he went outside he researched all across the world worked with dr norman borlag and he was so committed to his 
goal of of eliminating hunger in india that he finally brought about the green revolution of india selflessness he won so many global prizes he won a lot of money out of those prizes for example 1987 world food prize he used this money for development of a research institute that will further improve the indian agriculture so he was completely selfless he was working for the society not for his own for gaining fame or gaining money he was working only for the society inclusivity he was working for gender inclusivity as you can see during his tenure at iri or during his tenure as the rajya sabha member community engagement he was able to inspire the farmers in punjab haryana and up to take up the cultivation of these high yielding varieties of seeds so that is what brought about the green revolution so he had always been a big fav he has always been a big supporter of community and en engagement when it comes to any kind of effort to improve the lives of the people because it is the community's life that we are trying to improve so we cannot take a decision in a in a silo sitting in a room we need to engage the community when we are trying to bring out solutions for their problems he was also a big environmentalist and he worked in conservation of environment at various locations specifically in kerala conservation of the endemic plants in the state of kerala so he worked very hard for that aspect as well so these are the learnings from the life of dr m s swami nathan so just to summarize this article we talked about the timeline regarding the life of the father of indian green revolution later we learned about what all can we learn from his life and if a question comes in gs4 what all can you write and what can what all can you actually instill in yourselves as you become the next generation of civil servants of india now we come to the prelims bite section here the first article is about the nobel peace prize Now this Nobel Peace Prize of 2023 it has been given to an Iranian activist. Now this activist Nargis Mohammadi she is currently imprisoned since the year 2021. In 2021 there was a protest against the government for rising prices and in that protest some people they were killed. So Nargis Mohammadi, she again started protesting against these killings as well as the price rise, and that is why she was later imprisoned in the jails of Iran. Now, why has she been given this Nobel Peace Prize? For her campaigns that support women rights, democracy, and the removal of death penalty in Iran. Now, if you all know that. right now also there is a protest that is going on for past many months it has been going on in iran for women's rights right so she has been supporting that movement while she is imprisoned as well so she did not get imprisoned because of this women's rights movement that is going on currently she got imprisoned back in 2021 now she has been imprisoned 13 times as of now in iran she is the 19th woman to win the nobel peace prize and the second iranian woman to win this who was the first iranian woman she was activist human rights activist shireen ebadi shireen ebadi won the nobel peace prize in the year 2003 why for her efforts to promote human rights democracy and gender equality 
so this is about the first article of prelims bites the second article is about how climate change is affecting amphibian extinction now there is a study that has been published in the journal the very good journal known as nature now this study it is based on data that is taken from the second global amphibian assist assist assessment that has been coordinated by the amphibian red list authority which comes under the IUCN international union for conservation of nature now according to this study which included evaluation of regarding extinction of more than 8000 amphibian species so there are more than 8000 amphibian species this study this assessment it was trying to evaluate the extinction threat to those amphibian species that we know about now according to the study two out of five amphibians currently they are at the risk of extinction the primary threat to the extinction that is causing the that might cause the extinction of these amphibians is what climate change the second threat is what habitat destruction and degradation which again can be caused due to climate change itself right so these are the biggest threats to the amphibian population now amphibians in general they are very sensitive to the changes in their environment amphibians are what amphibians are those varieties of animals that can live both in water as well as on land the most prominent example is what frogs okay so these amphibians they are already very sensitive to the changes in their environment and because of climate change because these changes in the environment they are getting they are increasing a lot and that is why the amphibians they are facing the wrath they are expecting their extinction now in india there are 472 known species of amphibians known species there might be so many other species that we have still not discovered so there are 472 known species out of which 50% are endemic that means 50% of these 472 almost 236 they are found only in india now we go to the next article which is about the nuclear test ban treaty now russian lawmakers yesterday they have declared that they might consider revoking the ratification of global nuclear test ban treaty the which is currently the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty ctbt now russia it could move to resume these nuclear tests why against the efforts by the western countries to support ukraine already there is usa has not ratified this treaty also these western nations they are supporting ukraine they are providing military and other support to ukraine right so russia is not liking it at all so russia has said if you have not ratified why should we still be bound by that treaty we will also revoke the ratification of this treaty and we'll start doing our own nuclear tests now about this nuclear test ban treaty a little bit about it it was signed back in 1963 it was known as nuclear test ban treaty it was signed in 1963 in moscow the initial signing parties between which it was signed included usa uk and ussr later on 100 more nations they signed this test ban treaty however the power it laid with usa uk and ussr with regards to veto power if there was to be any changes in this nuclear test ban treaty 
then usa uk and ussr if they did not want that change to happen they could veto that change apart from that all the decisions they were taken on a consensual basis what was the formal name of this treaty it was called treaty banning nuclear weapon test in the atmosphere outer space and under water so please note that it did not include any kind of tests under ground so the test this can still be conducted under the ground they could still be conducted under the ground but not in these locations what was the trigger why did the us why did us and ussr which were such staunch enemies they come together during the cold war to sign this treaty the trigger was the cuban missile crisis of 1962 which almost brought the world at the verge of a nuclear war so to prevent any such kind of an issue the nuclear test ban treaty was signed in 1977 negotiations started on the comprehensive nuclear ban treaty which was also include bans on these underground test of nuclear weapons so a draft ctbt it was passed in united nations general assembly in the year 1996 however it has still not come into force why because to come into force it needs to be signed by all nuclear powers and 44 members of conference on disarmament now these are those members who have the nuclear reactors so if the if suddenly this is decide to go rogue they can even create nuclear weapons so that is why their signature is also necessary by the year 2007 all of these countries they had signed it except three major nuclear powers which is india pakistan and north korea so these three countries they have nuclear weapons they have proven availability of nuclear weapons but they did not sign ctbt rest of the countries all these countries that had to sign ctbt for it to enter into force the rest of them they have signed it however 10 of these they have still not ratified it they have still not passed a resolution in their national assemblies regarding this treaty and two major countries who have not done this includes usa and china okay so that is why russia is very much agitated that usa has not ratified they are not having any kind of ban on their nuclear testing then why should we stay back the next article is about the monetary policy committee according to the latest report of the monetary policy committee they are there are no changes in our repo rates however the rbi monetary policy committee it has stated that in future we might have to take certain steps to rein in the inflation because it is expected that in the near future the inflation might increase why there were uncertainties regarding food fall in kharif sowing of pulses and oil seeds okay so that will affect the food availability that will add to what consumer per price index also low reservoir levels this is this will cause what this will cause a decline in availability of water for irrigation which will again affect our food availability okay so that is why the reserve bank of india has said that even though right now we are not changing our repo rates but in future we might have to change them according to the the inflation of that time now about monetary policy committee it is a statutory committee which has its statutory status under section 445 zb of rbi act 1934 it is constituted by the central government through a notification in their official gazette so it is constituted by the central government 
it has its mention in the RBI Act of 1934. It was first constituted in the year 2016 in the month of September. It has six members. The head of these, the head of the committee is the Governor of Reserve Bank of India. Now every member has one vote. However, the casting vote or the tiebreaker vote, it lies with the governor. So, governor basically has two votes. The rest of the members have one vote. So, for example, there is a 3 is to 3 voting on a particular aspect. Then, the only then the governor will cast the casting vote. Okay. Now, this committee, it must meet a minimum of four times an year and the quorum the minimum number of members that are required for the meeting to start, it is four members. Now, inflation targeting. So, the Monetary Policy Committee, it will set the rates, the repo rate of the economy on the basis of what is the inflation level. So, the aim of this committee is to keep inflation in a particular bracket, within a particular bracket. So, what is this bracket? 4 plus minus 2 percent. That means it should lie between 2 to 6 percent. Now what inflation are we talking about? We are talking about consumer price index and not wholesale price index. Now this target, this bracket of 2 to 6 percent it is the currently set inflation target. Now, this target, it can be changed. It can be set by the central government in consultation with RBI every five years. Since the incorporation of the Monetary Policy Committee, it has stayed the same. That is 4 plus minus 2 percent. Now, if the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, it fails to maintain this particular target that has been provided, it needs to submit a report to the central government, including what were the reasons that they failed, what can be the remedial solutions, first is reason, solution, and the time period estimated time period within which they we will further once again achieve back the inflation target. So, reason, solution and the time frame. Okay. So, that was the last article. With that, we have come to an end to this session. Just quickly revising the prelim by its section. Nobel Peace Prize given to Nargis Mohammadi of Iran. Climate change is causing amphibian extinction the, according to this study that has been published in Nature. Nuclear test ban treaty Russia has stated that they might consider getting out, revoking the ratification of this global nuclear test ban treaty. Then we talked about the monetary policy committee of the Reserve Bank of India that has the purpose of keeping the inflation in the economy within a certain bracket. So, here are the main practice questions. The first question is, higher education institutes can play a significant role in achieving the sustainable development goals. Comment. So, this is a 10 marker, 150 words. You have been given what all goals can be fulfilled by the higher educational institutes. So, you can mention all that in this particular question. You can give your information maybe in a tabular manner. Goal, what it says. Goal 1, it talks about poverty and how can the universities help in this. The second question is from GS4 perspective. As a civil servant, what can you learn from the life of Dr. M. S. Swaminathan? All the values, they have been stated very clearly in the in that slide where we were discussing it, empathy, grit and commitment, inclusivity, scientific rigor and so on. So, you can mention all that in this particular answer. So, with that, we come to an end to this session. I hope you were able to understand all the concepts discussed over here. Do not forget to head to our Telegram channel 
just after this session ends because there is a quiz that, ha that has been created on this session on our telegram channel the link for the same is available in the video description so thank you very much and have a very good day